Kansas City, it's a town of many nicknames. The best town this side of hell, the Paris of the Plains, modern Sodom, Athens of the West, home to the wettest block in the world. Some of these claims may seem salacious, but we earned our nicknames. As early as 1840s to the 1850s, women began gathering along the river to entertain the dozens of steamboats and steamboat men that might have lined along the banks. As steamboating gave way under the success of the railroads, the Scarlet District expanded to surround the growing communities south and into the dusty bottom land where hotels brimmed with deep pocketed cattlemen. And hence began the city's attempt to police this growing industry. Every culture from every time period consists in part of women behaving in ways scrutinized and regulated by people in power. And so it was by 1860 when the city of Kansas published a list of prohibited public nuisances, including keeping a dead animal carcass outside for over 24 hours, <laughs> leaving green and salted hides out in the open, procuring, running, or attending all body houses, houses of ill fame, assignation houses, or any other resorts that allowed prostitution. Most of the early red light district activities were concentrated in the North End neighborhood, bounded by 2nd Street to the north, 6th Street to the south, Main Street to the east, and May Street to the west. Brothels ranged from low-end cribs, where single women worked alone, to assignation houses, where rooms were available to sex workers on a more informal, part-time, casual basis and to the higher-end resorts full of well-groomed girls managed and maintained by businesswomen referred to as madams. Between 1895 and 1897, the Kansas City Times reported more than 115 arrests related to prostitution, but that made little to no impact on their operations. By 1900, a total of 147 body houses existed in the city. By 1910, there were 47 houses alone in the city market, employing up to 250 girls. It's hard to imagine that one year later, nearly 900 brothels were reported in existence in the city. By 1950, Kansas Cityans admittedly spent $1.5 million on public prostitution. As with early Sumerian times, Kansas City had found a way to incorporate sex tourism as an attractive asset to visitors. The fame of the Kansas City Red Light District extended far and wide. Visitors getting off the trains were greeted by men extolling services provided by hotels, saloons, restaurants, barbershops, and peep shows and brothels. They might ask, would you like to bet on a horse? Would you like to try your luck at cards, dice, or slots, or perhaps you would like to have a girl? This vice was tolerated just enough by residents because of its economic value and its segregation from the lives of average Kansas Cityans who were stowed and bound to marginalized neighborhoods where this oldest profession could beckon. Even as the law came knocking on the doors of the brothels, more prostitutes filled Kansas City's original red light district, dotting the streets just south of the Missouri River near present-day Delaware Street. The massive residential growth from 6,000 people in 1865 to 297,245 in 1905 brought with it thousands of young, scrappy immigrant men who might have been found grading our streets or landing jobs in the factories and packing houses in nearby West Bottoms. Immigrant communities are 100% responsible for building the city that we love today. These men crowded into neighborhoods such as Vinegar Hill, Juniper, or Hell's Half Acre, a shanty district among several others that consisted of deplorable living conditions among the soot and turmoil of an impoverished people working for nickels a day. Around the corner, the Union Depot was constructed in the West Bottoms in 1878, and a new district formed full of saloons, fully securing the success of this vice trade in that neighborhood. 
By 1871, the language of the city ordinances strengthened to list prostitution as more than a public nuisance and noted it was an offense against public morals and decency. Whosoever was affiliated with body houses, whether as a tenant, a landlord, or an inmate, it's a reference to the girls who worked there, a patron, or anyone simply having knowledge about an operation as such would be charged a misdemeanor and fined anywhere from $25 to $500. Additional ordinances forbade the owners of taverns from employing so-called lewd women, women with reputation of being prostitutes, women who sang too loudly or danced in an indecent manner. They couldn't even have female bartenders. A tavern owner would be fined anywhere from $50 to $100 if he disobeyed that ordinance. By 1880, owners of body houses and known prostitutes were not even permitted to to ride any kind of public transportation, horses, buggies, carriages. Kansas City by now had become a popular town with many visitors and plenty of accommodations such as horse-drawn streetcars, food, hostelry, retail shops, and of course cabarets, live theater, and all the offerings of its red light district. Yet with all its refinement, and economic success, here was a town still dumping its garbage in the Missouri River, living among the dust and filth of a mostly unpaved roads and sidewalks, engulfed in stockyard fumes and the waste of the West Bottoms. Often residents witnessed dead animals in the streets piling up or floating down the river. Kansas City was in the throes of growth and kicking and screaming along the way. Despite the substantial cultural development from its beginnings only a few decades prior, Kansas City was still known as barely more than an overgrown frontier town. One character tra trait proceeded over all others, and one reputation spread like prairie smoke through the United States. Here was a lawless land, and one that harbored and nurtured its saloons, brothels, and vice trade. A person could get whatever he or she wanted, in this place, especially gambling joints in Kansas City's notorious Battle Row, where dice rolled from sunup to sundown, rural and immigrant girls who found their way to the city could leave their past behind and find safe harbor with the city-dwelling madams. Brothels were also referred to as sporting houses filled with sporting women. The sportiest among them all was Kansas City's most famed and successful madam, the queen of the red light district herself, Miss Annie Chambers. Born Leanna Lovell in 1842 down in Lexington, Kentucky. For a while she led a fairly simple life that quickly devolved into a series of tragedies leading her path to drastically change course. Chambers lost her first child before the age of one. Later she was thrown from a buggy while pregnant, resulting in a three-day coma during which she lost her child in utero and also her husband simultaneously, who died in a completely unrelated accident where he fell from a railroad trestle. She was wrecked. She moved away from Kentucky and found a new life in prostitution. She fell in love once more, in part followed that love to Kansas City, but also in the hopes of expanding her newfound work. To her utter dismay upon arrival, she discovered the existence of that man's wife and children. Chambers then opened her famous Annie's Resort on the cusp of the completion of the Hannibal Bridge, which guaranteed her overnight success. The Hannibal Bridge was built by Octave Chanute in 1869 and brought the first ever railroads barreling over the previously unbridgeable Missouri River. Directly into Kansas City and with it came hundreds of thousands of curious tourists, travelers, and businessmen who landed not far from her enticing doorstep. She ran her top-of-the-line, opulent, two-story, 25-room brothel filled to the brim with expensive furniture, elegant glass chandeliers at 201 West 3rd Street on the southwest corner of 3rd and Wyandotte Street's present-day River Market. It's unfortunately not there any longer. The dining room and ballroom were decked out in a red and gold with extravagant paintings. Chambers women were well-known around the nation for being beautiful, smart, and well-mannered. At any time, she had a staple of 15 to 20 girls who made nearly 200 a week, half of which they kept. 
that dollar amount in today's figures would be about $2,000 a week. The large dance hall on the first floor housed an extravagant gilded metal and glass chandelier. Only the most expensive china and extravagant glassware were used to serve the gentlemen. A giant room in the back hosted elaborate wine suppers for men, where a $5,000, 300-pound, 8-foot by 7-foot, custom-made mirror lined with blue bulbs and covered in paintings and engravings dominated that room. The cost of that mirror today would, would have been about 130000 the remains of this mirror now hang in the large stairwell of the National Archives near Union Station. A glimpse into the district can be seen from the view of author John Edward Hicks, who writes in his book, Adventures of a Tramp Printer, in 1950, that in the 1880s, the assortment of fie de jouet, pleasure girls, in Kansas City ranged from the high-priced beauties kept by Annie Chambers on Wyandotte Street to the cheap crones of lone cottonwood presided over by Mother Smith. In between, there were Nellie Scott's place on West 4th, Lou Regards on Walnut, Molly Pawpaw's on Grand, M. Williams on 3rd, Bessie Stevens is on Broadway, Millie O'Brien's at 1st and Main's, Dutch and Annie's at Lewis's place, and in literally a tent kept by the notorious Becky Reagan at the foot of Main Street. The foot of Main Street is the banks of the Missouri River. Madame Eva Prince ran her self-proclaimed high-end house of pleasure nearby Chambers on the northwest corner of 4th and Wyandotte. Both Chambers and Prince advertised in a freely circulated little black book where potential clients could get a sense of what and whom they'd find at any certain brothel. This original document, these are two of the advertisements from it, this original document is, is housed about 20 feet away in the Missouri Valley Room. It's very, very neat to see. A young crib girl named Madeline spent her 17th year employed by the well-respected Madame Lovejoy's brothel around the corner and exclaimed in a later biography that despite the attempt by authorities to quell the dealings of prostitution to one district, vice flourished in all parts of the burgeoning city. She described life in Kansas City as one big 24-hour party. If one had money to pay, one could indulge in the brothels, in the wine rooms, in the gambling houses. In her biography, Madeline's friend tells her that a girl who got into the right kind of house had good food, a beautiful room, and was cared for if she got sick. She was not preyed upon by a class of men who wanted something for which they were not willing to pay. She was protected by the, by the police, and what was still more important, she was protected from the police. Brothels merely had to pay a measly fine for operating illegally, and most of them made so much money that it was nothing to pay these fines. Chambers ran her successful business from 1870 to 1913, despite its close proximity to the Kansas City Police, who were headquartered a few blocks away. <laughs> Concert saloons, or honky-tonks and free and easies, as they were called, served as precursors to the era of vaudeville known in certain crowds as training schools for vice and prostitution, and a total blight on the morality of Kansas City, Missouri, marring our good name. Norman Plass was a superintendent of the Anti-Saloon League, claimed that concert saloons were havens for streetwalkers and that they all ought to be closed because they were little more than licensed houses of prostitution. The Anti-Saloon League was first formed as an Ohioan nonpartisan group in favor of all things prohibition, and it advocated for the abolition of concert saloons entirely. The League believed that the evil of the concert saloon was that it pretended to be an innocent place in support of the poor man. Most of the concert saloons in Kansas City packed into the growing red light districts near Chambers on 3rd and 4th Streets along Maine, Delaware, and Walnut where the notorious gambling district known as Battle Row existed. The Walnut Street Theater, located at 4th and Walnut, regularly booked minstrels, burlesque, for female impersonators, pantomime, and other variety acts. Some saloon keepers developed wine rooms in order to offer an added feature to their establishment, especially with prohibitionists calling for the eradication of the saloon. The most luxurious wine room in Kansas City, of course, belonged to Annie Chambers. Wine rooms were to deal solely in wine, cider, and sodas, but were often lavishly decked out with gilded mirrors where drinks were offered in beautiful glassware, and if you knew how to ask properly, you could get your glass filled with beer or whiskey. 
The Colosseum claimed title to the basest wine room and was referred to as the rowdiest and most disreputable dive in all of Kansas City. The Colosseum stayed open later than most of its kind and was a drunken last stop for its people. Wine rooms offered a place for women to gather in an otherwise unfriendly social environment, but they were often criticized as a place where women in tight and scanty garments enticed men to spend their money on drinks. In 1893, the Women's Christian Temperance Union produced a temperance opera called Old Oaken Bucket, which cinematically begged police commissions to refuse licenses to establishments that maintain wine rooms. I'm looking for that opera. If you guys know where it is, Jeremy, let me know. In 1894, Kansas City's Mayor Webster Davis issued a statement to abolish wine rooms in the city and threatened to revoke the licenses of any establishments permitting women in wine rooms. They were considered a great win toward prohibition of the sin industry. Wine rooms proved controversial for years to come, but remained functional attachments for, to saloons for decades. In the 1923 report, 10 Years of Fighting Vice in Kansas City, the Society for Suppression of Cur Commercialized Vice claimed that the moral housekeeping of bounty houses was in full effect thanks in part to the passing into law of the injunction and abatement law by the 51st General Assembly, which forced all brothels to shut down. The society stated that its report that it had tried for years to pass this law and believed that women gaining the right to vote finally made it happen in 1921. Most everyone, including Annie Chambers, assumed it would pass over within a few weeks, but it did not. Despite running one of the most long-standing, reputable, successful brothels in the region at nearly 80 years old, Chambers softened to reform. She one afternoon sat listening to a sermon coming through from the windows open next door. The sermon served as a funeral for a child who had died from neglect and was very meaningful to her. So deeply moved by the kindness and love and the words of the man speaking, she befriended him, leading her to total reform into Christianity, where she spent the last decade running a legitimate boarding house, developing a meaningful relationship with the Reverend David Bulkley and his wife, Beulah Bulkley, who purchased the brothel next door, which was Madame Lovejoy's, and to whom Chambers relinquished her house of ill repute, Ill repute upon her death in 1935. If you would like to visit Miss Annie Chambers, you can at the Elmwood Cemetery. She's buried alongside a lot of other notable Kansas Cityans. One of my favorite topics in all of Kansas City history is this neighboring vice district, which had developed in earnest and would go on to be one of the densest blocks for consumption, that of the infamous wettest block in the world, occupying the 1700 block on 9th Street near State Line in the Stockyard District. Here was a land full of transplants, vagrants, and immigrants working the saloons, packing houses, and nearby factories. The block was vile to outsiders, but instigated a sense of camaraderie among its occupants who relied on it for more than its vice. It was a genuine reprieve from a very hard way of life, but also served as a sort of community center for residents occupying the shanties down there. The saloons would also cash checks on Saturdays for the workers, proving again to be a necessary asset to the working class. Without question, it was the place where a very wet Missouri plied dry Kansas with all of its booze. The wettest block and its patrons adhered to the all scratch your back if you'll scratch mine mentality introduced by saloon owner turned ward boss Jim Pendergast. The famous Pendergast family packed their belongings and moved from Galapagos, Ohio to St. Joseph, Missouri in 1859. Jim was only three years old. He was the second oldest of nine siblings. Not long after he moved to Kansas City in 1876, he began developing strong ties to the working class men he spent his days toiling among in the D.M. Jarbo foundry, the A.J. Kelly foundry, and finally as an iron worker at the Keystone Iron Works. Jim's gradual rise to power gained momentum only a short eight years after his arrival in the grimy bottomlands when he was elected to de delegate, the represent, delegate to represent the sixth ward. Jim's advocacy for and protection of the blue collar workers in his neighborhood solidified a strong political base of freight handlers, switchmen, factory workers, packing house men, grocers, bakers, butchers, and drovers, a base that only continued to grow. 
Pendergast became known as Alderman Jim, eventually representing the entire first ward or all of the West Bottoms from April 1892 to 1910. He was a sympathetic man beloved by his people for its efforts to improve the lives of the underserved. He fought against a proposal from the city government that would cut firemen's salaries by 15%. He fought on behalf of the people of the West Bottoms again when he opposed an ordinance that would have removed the only fire station to serve the ward. He advocated allocating city funds to build the West Terrace Park on the unsightly bluffs overlooking the bottomlands. He offered up bail when 10 workers were caught playing bunco and arrested. And above all this, he kept the people fed at dinner time and with coins rattling in their pockets, which was a guarantee that they would return the favor at the polls. Jim's little brother, Boss Tom, Thomas Tom Pendergast, was an ox of a man built for strong arming. And he landed in the dusty world of the West Bottoms and quickly became appointed as the superintendent of the street, a coveted position of power. The arrival of Tom, or TJ, to his friends, Pendergast marks one of the most pivotal moments in the development of Kansas City. He was like a sleeping monster, and he came and awoke with a fervor that enabled his total control of Jackson County, and eventually the entirely, entirety of the state of Missouri operated in his shadow. He perfected his brother's political system, known as bossism or machine politics, after Jim's death in 1911. Machine politics was the calling card of the Pendergast brothers, and it was a system that relied on bribery, bullying, and straight up lying and cheating in order to set key people in crucial positions of power, such as Jackson County Court judges, police chiefs, mayors, and city managers. To summarize this time period and the integral power of the Pendergast duo on the development of our city, I'm going to offer up a following quote directly from the article of The Social Evil in Kansas City, Machine Politics and the Red Light District, which is published on the amazing website, uh, Pendergast Years, that the library has put together. In a city whose fortunes were for decades so tightly bound up with those of one powerful and corrupt man, it becomes impossible to separate the success of one from the financial prosperity, however illicitly gained, to, of the other. In other words, the cultural and political environment in Kansas City that proved so conducive to the rise of industries like the railways and the stockyards is the very same one that led to the flourishing of all manner of vice in the very same place. So when we reflect on the industries, systems, and individuals responsible for the growth and development of Kansas City during the Pendergast years, we would do well to remember that a significant portion of that success was due to the class of laborers who were so often written out of official histories and progress narratives. Without vice industries in general and commercialized sex work specifically, Kansas City would not have been the thriving wide open town it was in the earliest decades of the 20th century. Life wasn't easy working and living in the West Bottoms. The unpaved streets consisted of little more than potholes filled with dust or mud or not. Overcrowded shanties and tenements filled in with residents on the outskirts of the mostly industrial neighborhood. Alleyways in between the buildings were so narrow that pedestrians had to walk single file when passing through them. A series of fires and floods perpetually plagued the neighborhood. The water devastated the nearby Union Depot from the 1903 flood, which was just around the corner from the infamous block. It nearly swept away the chandeliers from the ceiling. 20 people died, many found themselves homeless, and most businesses in the area se sustained severe damage. In both instances, the displaced residents and survivors of the floods found solace in Big Jim Pendergast, who provided great financial support and helped them get back on their feet. Mother Nature didn't seem to phase the 24 out of 26 storefronts on the West 9th Street that housed the wettest block. Though most of the buildings were long, narrow, scrubby shacks, it still proved nearly impossible to secure vacant real estate in the district. For a man who was fortunate enough to secure a permit to dispense liquids in this locality, writes a journalist for the Inter-Ocean, has a better prospect for a fortune than the owner of a mine in cobalt or the possessor of a sure thing tip on the races. Speaking of gambling, a favorite, time of, a favorite game of, of the time was called Pharaoh. And it was played primarily on the luck of the draw and played often and played everywhere. The gambler would bet against the house on, a, on what suit, color, or number the dealer would pull next. A game of pharaoh was often referred to as pharaoh bank and consisted of a banker, the dealer, and bunters, those wagering. 
It was an easy game to learn and even easier to win and lose big money fast. Records indicate that some pharaoh men would gamble the clothes and accessories right off their back. Reformers despised the ease at which decent men fell prey to this game. The General Assembly of the Territory of Missouri enacted Missouri's very first gambling law on January 8, 1814, setting fines for those convicted of gambling between $50 and $500. Specific games mentioned included faro bank, roulette, and equality. Kansas leg legislature presented a bill in 1875 that would make public officials forfeit their positions if ever found playing games of chance or gambling. <coughs> By the 1870s, Kansas City's battle roll Battle Row sprawled the seedy area occupying nearly six blocks along Main Street from 2nd Street to Missouri Avenue. Battle Row attracted Wild West men we all know, like Wild er Wyatt Earp, Wild Bill Hickok, Bat Masterson, and the Jess James gang. Doc Holliday and other boys turned men from the behind of a, a Colt 45. These outlaws lent a heavy hand in the development of the infamous district, so called for the short-tempered men who hung around there. They were quick to violence and only capable of a hand-on-the-gun mentality. The thieves who hung around the battle row helped live it up to its name. This area also attracted local cattlemen and businessmen who shared one desire, pressing their luck and getting rich quick. There's one quirky story I want to tell you from Battle Row and then I'll move on. Bob Pody who ran Pharaoh Number 3, a gambling joint described above all others as the only trustworthy place with an honest card dealer. Poti ran his joint just off Main Street on Missouri Avenue. He was a gentleman who wore black long tail coats and tall silk hats. His was a more refined establishment compared at least to the disorderly conduct of, conduct of others surrounding him. Jim Bassett's Pharaoh Number 12 or Marble Hall run by Jake Forcott on Main Street as the story goes, Bob Pody's joint was the only one without blood on its hands until a stranger rode into town and had the audacity to tell him that he was misdealing. Kansas City's beloved Prince of Dealers, not too long after, escorted the stranger out of the hall with a bullet in his head and in no time was back to deal another round. <laughs> on a nice autumn evening in September, the Marble Hall Saloon attracted the patronage of Julius Hooks, Hooks pointed his 45 caliber Colt revolver at gambling man Joe Bagley, and in an instant, a bullet ripped through Bagley's abdomen and killed him. The Marble Hall restaurant would offer up cheap 50-cent meals consisting of clam chowder, mutton, spring lamb, calf brains, baked chicken pie, sweet breads, corned beef, cabbage, and new potatoes, Kentucky hoe cake, butter, and milk. Come for the gambling, stay for the hot plate, and pray you wouldn't get caught in the crossfire. Unfortunately, Poti closed his shop when legal registration started tightening up in the early 1880s. The king of Pharaoh's departure from Kansas City's Battle Row came with the pomp and circumstance of his one-man parade marching all the way down Main Street with his top hat on high and his gold cane swinging. Once he reached the Missouri River, it is said that he continued walking to the bottom of the riverbed. Almost 20 years later, the gambling houses had all spread everywhere in the city. Dick Stone ran a craps house and saloon, better known as the Olympic Club, at 559 Grand. The gambling men here used bells as a means to alert players on site of potential raids. It wasn't foolproof, and Stone was arrested. A gentleman by the name of Sandy Edwards ran an illegal gambling house on East 12th. The place was fitted with an electric buzzer under a billiard table, which they used to notify the club of arrival of a member who was with his, without his key and likely undercover. Up to a dozen warrants produced went unserved for illegal gambling houses throughout downtown. Police force claimed they could not find the gentleman in charge ever, although each man was highly known and seen around town. There's hardly an officer in town, writes the author of a Kansas City Journal article, who could not find Sandy Edwards on most days of the week. Most burlesque houses could be found in the working class neighborhoods with brothel, brothels and saloons as their neighbors. Burlesque houses attracted thousands of attendees weekly. The Theater Comique quickly became one of the most popular places to see salacious performances in Kansas City. The theater was originally located at 4th and Delaware near the Jackson County Railroad Stables and was described as a hotbed of sin that was full of wild, drunken revelry that attracted tough men and tougher women. The floors were wet with muck and booze. 
It presented a combination of burlesque shows and seedy plays, including one called Forbidden Pleasures. Theatre Comique was accused of employing wine room talent, which was a phrase synonymous with young girls seen as fresh victims to the exploits of burlesque and prostitution. It relocated to an old building where the Walnut Street Theater had first opened. The name paid respect to a popular namesake in New York. Famous performers included clog dancers, tramp poets, and the armless song and dance of artists Fairchild and Hindel. According to a 1928 article by the Kansas City Post, each box seat could hold a cowboy, a girly, and a bottle of champagne. <laughs> After the comique's steady success a notorious venue that paid no mind to respectability, more theater comiques cropped up in the less, fine, less refined wild western cities such as Dodge City, though that they called theirs the Comey Q. Chicago was said to be a recruiting city that would ship girls all over to work in burlesque houses. The Chicago Tribune claimed that some girls were promised fame on the big stage and were then misled to live a life of infamy. One rec recruiter in particular, John W. Thompson, who ran one of the most notorious dens in the South, recruited mostly servant and factory girls be the, between the ages of 13 and 24 and guaranteed them money, fame, and luxury. Harry Howard, who performed at the Theater Comique in Kansas City for several months in 1878, left to become a stage manager ran by John Thompson out of an, the Atlantic Hotel in Dallas, but died shortly after from consumption. Over the years, the Theater Comique engaged in exploits beyond burlesque shows. By 1880, it charged 25 cents for the public to view such oddities as real-life husband and wife murdering duo known as the Benders. They stopped off for public gawking at the Theater Comique before they were hauled off to enjoy their retirement in Oswego, Kansas jail. The employment of Robert Ford offered another bizarre experience for public viewing. There are some discrepancies to the nuanced details of the story below, but I tell it as I've come to understand it. After killing Jesse James and being charged with first degree murder, Robert Ford and his brother were escorted by army deputies to the Theater Comique where they participated in a two week performance that detailed the events of the murder. The brothers played themselves, slaying Jesse James, over and over for a full two weeks before being pardoned by the Missouri governor only hours before hanging for the deed. Because of the pardon, they were free to continue making money from their notori notoriety in relation to James' death. In 1883, the proprietor of Theater Comique, George Fredericks, was shot and killed by reporter John Bell of the Evening Star. Bell claimed self-defense and put the blame on what he called usual female troubles. The, murder, the murderous circumstances, he claimed, illustrated the duplicity of women and the faultless credulity of men. On October 9, 1895, around 2.45 a.m., a fire started in the Theater Comique. By morning, the inferno had destroyed the old building, causing 3,000 in damages to nearby buildings and a total loss of 19,500, which would be about 590,000 today. A reformist community member claimed that a cigarette had started that fire that destroyed the theater and that it was the first good work that a cigarette had ever been known to do. <laughs> Other burlesque venues to operate with unsavory reputations included the Century Burlesque, the Gaiety Theater, Empress Theater, Garden Theater, and the Gillis Theater. In 1899, Ed Butler, proprietor of the famed St. Louis Standard Theater, built the Standard Theater on land at 12th and Central. He employed Joseph R. Donegan, known as the King and Angel of 12th Street, in the early 1900s. Donegan was a free-spending, easy-lending, happy-go-lucky chap who managed the theatrical Edward Hotel and the Standard Theater, which in turn would become the Centrally Burlesque and now the Folly Theater. In the years between 1911 and 1918, Donegan ran a small and uninhibited kingdom. One staple figure on the scene who became everyone's favorite late-night piano player was a man named Squirrel. The Folly would go on to host the illustrious Gypsy Rose Lee and hometown girl Sally Rand, made famous by her bubble and feather dances. The Gaiety, Gaiety Theater was a burlesque house opened at 1909 at the corner of 12th and Wyandotte near the Mulebach Hotel, once the home of A.W. Armour, meatpacking industry baron. By the 1920s, the Gaiety House was hosting big-time vaudeville such as Jean Bedini's Peak Ebu Review. It was heralded as an immoral and indecent place. An all-black orchestra played live but could not attend performances in this segregated theater. A popular booze joint called College Inn occupied the building after the 1930s. 
Just down McGee Street at 12th, the neighboring Empress Theater was fined $500 for employing dirty and rotten women after it was raided in December 30th, 1929. With the building of the Garden Theater at 13th and McGee, Kansas City saw its largest vaudeville house with a capacity of 2,600. Artificial greenery and garden decor covered the interior. Stars and clouds burst across the curved ceilings, creating a charming and whimsical effect on the audience. In 1913, it ran daily matinees at 2.20 p.m. and an evening shows at 8.20 p.m. The theater nearly lasted through Prohibition, but disappeared in 1930. The Gillis Theater was a renowned opera house built by Mary Troost in honor of her deceased uncle, William Gillis. Despite its opulent size, polished glass chandeliers, and the fine walnut that coated its interior, it only cost $140,000 to build. Once the river trade slowed and the city started to develop the South, the Gillis Opera House went from hosting large budget operas to bloodthirsty melodramas and late night burlesque shows and films. Gift, buckets of, gift boxes of trinkets, candies were sold at intermission of burlesque shows, while the MC could also sell smut magazines. One MC claimed that if he were caught, he'd be in Leavenworth by morning. The Gillis Theater was later described as a dump located in a dingy building on Skid Row near the North End, the most colorful yet worst of all time. In its very last days, it is said that the dancers always left their shoes on for fear of contracting hoof and mouth disease. <laughs> Fires claimed the lives of many Kansas City theaters, and the Gillis was no exception. A 1925 headline claimed that the movie Flaming Passion was being shown as supplement to burlesque entertainment when a fire ripped through the Gillis killing 30 and burning down the theater. Originally built as a five-story office building in 1888, the Blue Goose Cabaret and Puritan Hotel at 200 West 9th Street saw many incarnations. By 1912, it debuted as the White Hotel with the Blue Goose Cafe in the basement. The G Blue Goose was a notable night spot and operated as a high-end tavern catering to the rich. It was known as one of the biggest and brassiest nightclubs around. But when Prohibition came and the Blue Goose passed from its highbrow scene into the hands of bootleggers, it is said the speakeasy bartender was often armed and on a hot day he might take off his shirt and tin bar nonchalantly wearing a 38 caliber pistol at his sh shoulder. Although Joe Donegan is said to have made three fortunes and lost four, his Edward Cabaret was so successful that boss Tom Pendergast mimicked its offerings in his own Jefferson Hotel located then in our present day river market. After the death of his older brother, Jim, Tom Pendergast expanded his power with the purchase of the Jefferson Hotel, located heart in, the, in the heart of the old town. Some joke that the lights of this hotel ought to have been red, too. Here, Pendergast conducted most of his business matters from his office and political club just off the, hot, just off the lobby. Pendergast outsmarted everyone when the reformers of the Society for Suppression of Commercialized Vice pressured the police board to take note of the immoral and unlawful happenings of the Jefferson. After a series of deaths and brawls and other distor disorderly conduct caused authorities to revoke the Jefferson's liquor license, prohibition loomed and the doomed fate of the Jefferson among other cabarets and saloons was inevitable, but a Pendergast miracle happened. City officials declared that 6th Street must be widened immediately and the corner on which the Jefferson stood must be raised. The unfortunate construction upgrade to the street led to the allocation of nearly $80,000 in damages to Pendergast. In essence, he was paid to close his hotel and cabaret when most others went into bankruptcy. In 1913, the Research Bureau of the Board of Public Welfare published a social prospectus of Kansas City showing evidence of crime, illness, dilapidated housing, and other social ills that plagued the Pendergast Rand districts, containing large portions of mostly immigrant and minor, minority groups, the exact people that the Pendergast machine relied on for their votes. Although the vice culture of prostitution and gambling and booze flourished even before the city's inception and into the turn of the century, its lushest era was the height of the Pendergast machine's most powerful decades of the 20s and 30s. The Vice District grew south, with the city stretching along 12th to 18th Streets and from Oak to the Paseo. 18th and Vine was known mostly for its jazz houses, but it also harbored a deviant ethos where female impersonators, drag shows, live sex shows, burlesque, and prostitution flourished. Downtown, the 1300 to 1400 block along Cherry Street became a sort of tourist attraction. Guests from out of town would walk the sidewalks along Cherry to see the women sitting in the window in their slinky garments. 
Jazz musicians were often hired to entertain guests in the higher end brothels after their earliest evening gigs ended. At 12th and Cherry Street, near present day City Hall downtown, the Reno Club, or the House of Swing, attracted guests to a marijuana smoke filled room where prostitutes worked freely. Man the manager employed taxi dancers, which is a term for call girls who could be hired for as little as 10 cents for a dance or hired for $2 to take them in upstairs. The sensation of taxi dancing swept through working class venues in the 1920s and was so called for relating the dancer's time spent with her customers to that of a taxi driver giving a ride to a stranger. Taxi dancing provided a platform for young unmarried men and women to dance, although the stigma was that of prostitute and John. <coughs> The Reno served beer for a nickel, scotch for 50 cents. The segregated venue, like most in Kansas City at the time, kept white folks downstairs and black folks in the balcony or on small bleachers in the bandstand. A lunch wagon hit, hitched up close by served liver, pig snouts and ears, hog maws, fish, chicken, and pork tenderloins. <laughs> a well-known house of prostitution ran from the corner of 11th and Cherry Streets. Here, 16 girls were on duty at any given time. The establishment was entirely protected by Char Charles Carollo, lead mob, ma mob man under Johnny Lazia in the late 20s. In 1932, Chief of Police Robert Phelan submitted a comp comprehensive report of all of his findings of immoral places and street solicitation. His list of establishments included apartments and houses concentrated on the 13th and 14th blocks of McGee to Holmes. According to Kansas City Times journalist, the girls would hiss at prospective, prospective clients to get their attention. The list named several hotels, including the following, lo located near Fifth and Walnut, Lackleed Hotel, Panama Hotel, Rollo Hotel, Jackson Hotel, further south, the Hotel Corrine, El Tor Hotel, the Holmes Hotel, Hotel Fritz, Hotel Francis, Hotel Strand, Grand, Travelers, and found between 14th and 19th Streets along Main Street, the Hotel Sutter and Hotel Central Annex. They employed porters with a mission to ask guests if they desired the companionship of pretty girls during their stay. Boss Tom Pendergast and his mob affiliates, namely Johnny Lazia, were virtually impossible to impose, especially during Prohibition. As long as profits kept up, it was beneficial to everyone to keep the city wide open. As with any successful trade in the city, Pendergast's hands were deep in the pocket of the growing jazz scene. To take a phrase from the author Amber R. Clifford, Pendergast maintained a network of marginalized subcultures that were very easy to police for his own business income and sway at the polls. Yes, Tom Pendergast was affiliated with brothels and cribs in the red light districts, but he also knew that he had a needy clientele and the middle to upper class businessmen who worked in downtown. His men only cabarets reached a zenith with the opening of the Chesterfield Club, located a block shy of the Jackson County Courthouse. Gus Skinny Gargata, younger brother of Charles the Wop Gargata, owned the club located at 320 East 9th Street. The Chesterfield gained notoriety for its businessmen's lunch, where men could get drink and gamble and arrange political meetings with Boss Tom, all while being served by high heeled waitresses wearing dainty see through cellophone aprons, revealing pubic hair shaved into hearts, diamonds, clubs, and spades. The waitresses evenly shared this duty, and no one suit was represented more than another on an any given night. <laughs> I can't figure the logistics out on that one, but. Um. Pendergast frequented the frame Chesterfield Club and conducted a lot of official business there, hosting officials and ward boss bosses. Though the Chesterfield Pendergast helped funnel the sexuality of the jazz scene directly into Kansas City's business district. The Chesterfield became a sought after tourist attraction and the establishment continued to have the full support of Tom Pendergast, who vowed to protect the venue, along with so many other joints, as long as it purchased liquor directly from him and his T.J. Pendergast Wholesale Liquor Company. The club was eventually closed down in 1939 as a common nuisance. And so, with the disappearance of its most famous club, went the city's most famous boss. It's often noted that gambling, election fraud, and most notably tax evasion were the demise of the Pendergast regime. But those things alone are not entirely true. Kansas City's self-anointed civic housekeepers comprised several groups of tenacious and steadfast women who organized before the 1940 elections that fully powered down the machine, 
giving way to the great cleanup of the 1940s with police chief Lear Reed at its helm. Of course, vice didn't go away with the fall of the Pendergast machine. It merely grew larger under the control of the mighty Sicilians, a tight-knit, organized, and powerful group who'd gained unfathomable strength since settling here in the 1900s. But that is a story for another day. <laughs> Perhaps the people and places mentioned today don't deserve a front row seat in Kansas City history books along other do-gooders. Maybe we think some of the things they did were vile and crude. Maybe they didn't contribute to our city the way that city planners, developers, or philanthrop philanthropists did. Maybe we think they ought to just crawl back into the dark corners that they came from. It really doesn't matter what we think today. The good, the bad, and the gritty of these people gives us the strong heart that makes us the Kansas City we are. It's the spirit that built Kansas City we all love today on the backs of these people. The culture, the nightlife, the adventure. And right now, whether we realize it or not, we are creating the Kansas City for future generations. So let's make it worth it. Let's go out with a little greater understanding for our neighbors, citywide, who are all here in the trenches with us, contributing to the culture of our city today. Let's go out with the turn of the century desire to, to continue to make Kansas City the best place in which to live. Thank you, guys. I, I, I want to mention and also apologize that I don't have books here today. Um, I tried really hard. It was a combination of storms and just a lot of people ordering stuff this time of the year that UPS did not fulfill its two-day promise. But um, I would be honored to pre-sell you a book. And, and um, Jeremy and the library has offered to let me sign them and keep them here. And you could pick them up at your leisure um, any time this week. And um, and $5 of every book sold today um, and for the foreseeable future is I'm going to de uh, donate to the library's organi organization known as RISE, which is the Refugee and Immigrant Services um, provided by the library. It's, a, it's an organization that I, I believe deeply in. And so any books sold today, um, a lot of money will be going to them too. And you can pre-sale outside. I'm also open to having some questions if, if anybody would like. Yeah, I, uh, I don't have research on that, but I doubt they did. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, that would have just been, uh, I guess, what you, uh, what you accept partaking. Yeah. Absolutely, and, and it due in part because a lot of people say St. Louis is the gateway to the West, you know, but actually we were the, the last developed city before the wild uh, terrain, and so a lot of people kind of came here with the hopes of going on and just stayed, so our city got populated by a lot of ver variety of people who added to the culture, I'll just say that. <laughs> Oh, yes, of course. Um, with that in mind, I didn't mention his name. <laughs> this gentleman, um, could you comment on what um, influence that uh, Mr. Truman, my, my brother said, had on, I know he was a protege of the Pitter Gas. It's questionable how much any relationship from him or how that worked. But what did Truman do to either protect his vice? What was his role? Um, well, oh, I'm so sorry. So he's asked the, the um, connection between Truman and Pendergast, which Truman was a protege of Pendergast, and it's been, it's pretty known that Pendergast helped get uh, Truman put into a place of power. Um, and his question directly asks how Truman helped protect or what his role was specifically within, like, the vice industry. And, um, the only thing that I can think to say to that is that he did a really good 
job politically of removing himself of all ties. Um, he, he didn't ever outright talk about his relationship to Pendergast other than showing up at his funeral. So um, I, I, I don't know. I just know that he politically was very kind of highbrow to not affiliate himself. So. I mean, I would. I, I love that. I love that question because part of what drives me to love local history is how it relates to my daily life. How I can translate that into what my actions are on a daily basis. And I think a lot. And this is a whole topic I didn't even touch today, which I really wanted to, but it was way too much for one talk. Was the jazz district and the people who were working in the jazz houses? I'm talking about the dishwashers. I'm talking about the women who would go tables to tables selling alcohol. These were the people who created the culture, who created the scene. It was way more than Charlie Parker, Benny Moat, and all these famous people who we give it credit to. So I mean, my first initial reaction to that is just the people who are doing like the craft industry stuff here across the board, the people are, who are starting the local restaurants and doing the local um, you know, bars and stuff that researchers 100 years from now will look back and be like, man, Swordfish Toms, that was really cool. Or you know, it's just so I think like we don't even realize that the things we're doing today are going to be looked at in future generations. And it's the people like Ryan Maybe, Andy Rieger, the people who are kind of uh, on the forefront of creating a strong culture in Kansas City today. Yes. Yeah. Uh, is there a commentary or an historical description in regard to that building down on South Warnell in reference to Mary's? That I see that name engraved on that building. Mm. I don't know I that one. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I'm. I will look. I don't know. That's interesting, though. I don't know anything about that. It's, it's called Mary's. Okay. It's still there. On South Warnell. Uh, yeah, down on Warnell, huh. approximately at 70th and Warnell. The word Mary above the window. Oh, interesting. Mary. Yeah. They were everywhere. I wouldn't doubt it. <laughs> Anybody else? If if not, I would be delighted to meet you outside or you know some other time. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you.